With the recent elections in the United States, we've heard a lot of folks referring to the Trump camp as people who have, quote, drank the Kool-Aid. We all know this phrase to mean someone putting blind faith into something that, to outsiders, just seems absurd and ridiculous. But where did the phrase drinking the Kool-Aid originate from? For those uninformed, this seemingly silly phrase may have shocking origins to you. The phrase is derived from the Jonestown Massacre in 1978, when the leader of an American cult called the People's Temple commanded his followers to commit mass murder-suicide, mainly by drinking cyanide-laced flavorade, a generic version of the popular Kool-Aid. How could one man convince hundreds of people to choose death for their beliefs? This is a brief history of Jim Jones and the People's Temple. As always, this episode of A Brief History contains graphic content and may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Jim Jones was born on May 13, 1931, near Lynn, Indiana. During his early years, Jones was known as an avid churchgoer, leading him to eventually enter the ministry after graduating from university. Jim Jones was known around the Indianapolis area as a radical and yet highly charismatic street preacher, and he drew in many other radical and idealistic members. Jones's belief and support of things like racial integration, supporting the homeless, and socialist ideals were off-putting to church elders and made Jones as abhorred as he was loved. In the mid-1950s, Jones made the decision to establish his own congregation, a Pentecostal church called Wings of Deliverance, which would eventually change its name to the infamous People's Temple. The People's Temple perfectly blended beliefs in a radical social justice that was beginning to bloom at the tail end of the 1950s, evangelical Christianity, and New Age spirituality, and the church attracted a passionate congregation. In 1960, the People's Temple affiliated themselves with the Disciples of Christ, and Jones was ordained as a minister in 1964. Just a year later, Jones began warning of a nuclear holocaust and ordered the People's Temple to relocate to California, specifically Northern California. The group would jump from town to town and eventually settled in San Francisco. It was around this time that Jones began leaning more and more away from the normalized teachings of the church and would start to describe himself as the prophet and became obsessed with power. Jones would claim that he was the reincarnation of important spiritual figures like Jesus Christ and Buddha, and that his eventual goal was communism, using religion to make his Marxist ideals easier to digest. Moving into the 1970s, the People's Temple was now located in San Francisco, and Jones's advocacy for racial injustice and other progressive issues made him a left-wing darling. Angela Davis, Harvey Milk, and the Black Panthers all came out in support of Jim Jones and the People's Temple, giving the group a significant amount of political influence. But while on the outside, the People's Temple seemed like a close-knit congregation of people who simply shared the same ideals, there were already red flags about the more sinister goings-on within the church, specifically in the church leadership. Followers of the People's Temple were under the expectation that they devote the entirety of themselves in their lives to this utopian project. Members were expected to turn over their personal wealth to the church, break contact with their families, and work long, unpaid hours for the church itself. Members were also expected to raise their children within the commune. Many members were even forced to sign false statements that they had molested their own children, as a sign of faith and commitment to the church. The church leadership would then hold on to these documents for potential blackmail should a member go against the church or try to leave. Jim Jones, all the while, never forgot about his fear of the United States being in imminent danger of a nuclear holocaust, and while raising the church up within the political field, spent much of his time searching for a new location to move his church. 
somewhere they could be safe, regardless of what was happening around them in the rest of the world. Before long, word of the misdeeds going on in the church began to leak, and the People's Temple were seeing allegation after allegation, scaring Jones enough to finally select a new location for his church to outrun the accusations of abuse. Jones chose a politically sympathetic socialist country, Guyana, and in 1977, the People's Temple moved into a remote location in the Guyanese wilderness. Hundreds of members of the People's Temple moved to Guyana, and despite the oppressive tropical climate and limited resources, the members of the People's Temple worked tirelessly and converted the jungle area into a seemingly functional agricultural commune that would come to be known as Jonestown, named after their charismatic leader. But Jonestown always looked better from an outside perspective, because on the interior it was all a lie. Julia Shears, author of A Thousand Lives, The Untold Story of Hope, Deception, and Survival at Jonestown, is quoted as saying, they can't actually grow food in this agricultural commune because jungle soils are too thin. Nothing grows and they're starving. He has this inner circle that goes out and begs for food or gets rotting food from the market and brings it back to Jonestown. It was a big facade. During the day while working their barren fields, the church would broadcast Jones's ramblings via megaphones placed strategically around the compound. After working the fields, members would attend mandatory propaganda classes, with attendance being enforced via armed guards. There was no way for the members who may have been having doubts about their perfect utopian society to complain or even discuss that maybe their commune wasn't all sunshine and roses. Members were not allowed to speak when the PA systems began blasting Jones's voice to the camp, and anyone who did come to you with complaints could have easily been a plant from Jones himself. Jones would send out members to discreetly complain or commiserate to other members in order to distinguish the lesser believers from the true believers. Anyone approached by someone with anything less than perfect to say about Jonestown was expected to report the complainer and denounce them for their own safety. On November 14, 1978, U.S. Representative Leo Ryan in California made a visit to Jonestown with relatives of the Jonestown members and a media crew to conduct what was considered an unofficial investigation into the mounting evidence and allegations of abuse happening within Jonestown. Representative Ryan and his crew stayed in Jonestown for four days, and according to all accounts, the visit went well enough. Representative Ryan met with Jim Jones and many of his followers over the course of his visit, interviewing them to try and dig for any evidence that the abuse allegations were true. While meeting with some families and individuals, they unsurprisingly asked if they could leave with Representative Ryan, and quite a few individuals took it upon themselves to simply walk out of the camp during the visit. Jim Jones was obviously unhappy. Representative Ryan discreetly requested a second plane meet them at the airstrip, scared that if he left anyone behind that wanted to leave, they may never have a chance to escape again. In the afternoon hours of November 18, 1978, Representative Ryan, his group, and the families and folks wanting to leave Jonestown congregated at the local airstrip. As Representative Ryan's plane got ready to leave, a dump truck carrying armed men from Jonestown arrived and opened fire on the plane and the people in it. One of the Jonestown members who was aboard the plane with Representative Ryan had actually faked his desire to leave and had brought a gun on board with him that he promptly began using. Representative Leo Ryan was killed, as were many others, leaving the rest gravely injured. Back at Jonestown, Jim Jones had seen that the end was near. It was clear that Representative Ryan's visit would not be the last made to Jonestown, and with the knowledge that he had ordered the death of a U.S. representative, the next visit would likely be sooner rather than later. At the compound, Jones gathered his followers together at the meeting house for his magnum opus. Jones was quoted as saying, It's over. It's all over. They're coming for us. This is it. 
it's time to transition to the other side. Jones had called for a mass murder-suicide. At the meeting house, just under a thousand followers of Jones were gathered, surrounded by rows of guards armed with crossbows and guns. Jones and the rest of the Jonestown leadership had prepared a cocktail of flavorade laced with cyanide. Jones instructed his followers that they were to feed the children the cocktail first, knowing that parents would have less of a reason to live if their children had already, quote, crossed over. Many children took the liquid willingly, but many were also forced to drink it. It was said to be surreal for many of the members who truly did not believe that Jones would actually kill them. It is said that many people didn't realize what was going on until they saw the children and babies frothing at the mouth. It took about five minutes for the flavor aid mixture to prove fatal. And while more members were willingly and unwillingly drinking the mixture, chaos broke out. Babies and children started screaming. Mothers and fathers watched in horror as their children left them. Some people attempted to flee. All the while, Jones chanting and reassuring his dying congregation. In the end, 900 members of Jonestown, more than 200 of them being children, were dead. And Jim Jones was dead as well, with a gunshot wound to the head. The photos of the scene are harrowing and will not be shown during this video. I simply warn the curious to be ready. Papers, junk, trash, and bodies are all shown strewn across Jonestown. In total, only 33 Jonestown members survived, including several of Jim Jones's sons. Larry Layton, the Jonestown member who had shot Representative Ryan on the plane, is the only member of the People's Temple cult to be tried for the mass murder-suicide. Layton was eventually convicted and sentenced to serve life in prison. Since the tragedy, the People's Temple has been rightfully labeled a cult, and Jim Jones has gone down in history as one of the most evil cult leaders in history. There have been many documentaries, podcasts, and movies inspired by the goings-on at Jonestown, and it is still widely studied by scholars. There are also numerous conspiracy theories surrounding Jonestown, including suspecting CIA involvement and it being part of Project MKUltra. These theories are wild and, in my opinion, soil the memory of the people who perished in November of 1978. Thank you for joining me for another episode of A Brief History. Thank you to Mermaid Simmer for building and landscaping the exterior of the Jonestown compound for this video. Be sure to check out her channel listed in the description box below. Thank you to my patrons who support this series, you are as always much appreciated. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more Sims true crime content every weekend. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time.